Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number 12, ready for teaching on June 17. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. It is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and our lesson title this week is The Seal of God and Mark of the Beast, Part 2, Sabbath Afternoon, June 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word shows us what is to come. But we also are thankful that your word shows us how you reacted and protected your people in the past. Large groups of people and individuals like each of us who are listening to this podcast today. Lord, as we study your word this week, we pray that from this we will take away the amazing message that you are there with us regardless of what is happening around us. May we know what we need to tell our friends. May we know what you are telling us in your word. Bless us as we worship you, as we study your word, and as we are influenced by your spirit. And Lord, wherever we are in the world, whether we're in Papakura, New Zealand, or Avondale in Queensland, or Avondale in New South Wales, or Mexico, where uh, Rogelio Martinez lives, or Lord, I'd also like to pray for others who've contacted us in the past, Laverne Anderson and Pilar Rodriguez. And then there's George Tavares in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and Alfredo Castro, and... Curitiva DMP, who is sharing these lessons in Iran and Iraq, and Lydia La Mountain, and Hubert Allen, and Sivalingam Sinathambi, who I assume is from Sri Lanka. Lord, wherever people are listening, in their homes, on the road, in public transport, or just while they're walking, may your spirit guide and bless as we study your word this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation 13 and verse 10. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Revelation 13, verse 10. Let's read that again. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In the 15th century, the Piedmont Valleys, high in the Alps of northern Italy, were home to the Waldenses, a people determined to stay faithful to their understanding of the Bible. As a result of their steadfast loyalty to Christ, they were fiercely persecuted. In AD 1488, the Waldenses in the valley of Lois were brutally murdered by the Roman Church for their faith. Another wave of persecution came in the 17th century, when the Duke of Savoy sent an army of 8,000 into their territory and demanded that the local populace quarter his troops in their homes. They did as he requested, but this was a strategy to give the soldiers easy access to their victims. On April 24, 1655, at 4 a.m., a signal was given for the massacre to begin. This time, the death toll was more than 4,000. History, unfortunately, is often repeated. The Mark of the Beast prophecy is about the final link in an ungodly chain of religious persecution that goes back through the ages. Like the persecutions of the past, it is designed to force everyone to conform to a certain set of beliefs and an approved system of worship. As always, though, God will have a people who will not capitulate. Sunday, June 11, The Deadly Wound As we've already studied, the beast powers of Revelation 13 and 14 represent a worldwide system of false worship. But there's more. Read Revelation 13, 5, Revelation 12, 6 and 14, Daniel 7, 25. 
How long would this power dominate the religious landscape in the previous centuries? Revelation 13 verse 5 And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. And Revelation 12 verse 6 Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. And Daniel 7.25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. The beast will continue for a specific duration of time in history. In symbolic time prophecies, a prophetic day equals a literal year. In Numbers 14.34 we read, For every day a year applying the Bible principle of counting a day for a year. Again, God says in Ezekiel 4 verse 6, I have appointed thee each day for a year. This principle has repeatedly proved itself accurate in interpreting Bible time prophecies, such as the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Calculating the time period mentioned in Revelation 13.5 of 42 months with 30 days in a month, we come to 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. The ancient calendars regularly had 360 days per year. In the 4th century, the Roman Emperor Constantine legalised Christianity throughout the empire. When he moved his capital in AD 330 to Byzantium to unite the eastern and western parts of his empire, it left a leadership vacuum in Rome. The Pope then filled this void. He became not only a powerful religious leader, but also a political force to be reckoned with in Europe. In AD 538, Justinian, the pagan Roman emperor, officially granted the Roman bishop the role of the defender of the faith. The medieval church exercised great influence from 538 AD to 1798 AD, including in the terrible persecution mentioned in the introduction to this week's lesson. Napoleon's General Berthier took the Pope captive in AD 1798 in exact fulfilment of the prophecy. Berthier and his army captured Pope Pius VI and unceremoniously removed him from the papal throne. The blow to the papacy was serious, but according to Revelation 13.12, the deadly wound would be healed, and the world would hear more from this power. A lot more. And so to finish the day, think about how amazing biblical prophecy is and how it reveals to us God's knowledge of future events. What should this fact teach us about why we can trust the Lord's promises, even the ones we don't yet see fulfilled? Monday, June 12, The Falling Away Read Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 9 to 12. What does Paul predict about the last days? What identifying marks does he give for the beast, the Antichrist power? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4 Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then verses 9 to 12, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because 
they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The Apostle Paul warns the Christian community of a falling away from the truth of God's word. He is concerned about the seeds of apostasy already present in the New Testament church, which will flourish in the coming centuries before the second coming of Christ. A counterfeit gospel would come into the church distorting the word of God. Satan is the one who is behind this apostasy. He is the true man of sin who desires to exalt himself above all that is called God and sits in the temple of God, as we read in verse 4. For the great deceiver works through human agencies to accomplish his purposes. The identifying characteristics in Daniel and Revelation reveal that the little horn of Daniel 7, the beast of Revelation 13 and 14, and the lawless one of 2 Thessalonians 2 represent the same entity. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary states it this way, A comparison with Daniel's prophecy of the blasphemous power that succeeds that of pagan Rome, and with John's word, picture of the leopard-like beast, reveals many similarities between the three descriptions of the little horn, the beast power, and the lawless one. This leads us to the conclusion that Daniel, Paul, and John are speaking of the same power, the papacy, and that's in volume 7, page 200, and 71. It is extremely important to remember that Bible prophecy is describing a system of religion that has compromised God's word, substituted human traditions for the gospel, and drifted away from biblical truth. These prophecies are given by a God of incredible love to prepare a people for the coming of Jesus. They are a rebuke to apostate religious organisations that have departed from God's word and not necessarily the people in them, as we see in Revelation 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Our message is about a system that has deceived millions. Though deceived, these people are much loved by Christ. Hence, we must treat them accordingly. And so to finish today, Matthew 7.12 reads, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. How must we apply this principle in dealing with the theme of the beast powers in Revelation 13 and 14? Tuesday, June 13, Satan's Final Strategy Surveys reveal a deep lack of trust in institutions and governments. Millions wonder, where is there someone who is morally fit to lead the world? Revelation's prophecies identify the beast power as the one who, under the auspices of a religious political union, will be the power believed fit to fill this role. Read Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14. How does John describe these final scenes of Earth's history? What powerful contrast is seen here? Revelation 17, beginning at verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. There are three significant points John makes in this passage. First, the political powers have one mind and give their power and authority to the beast. Second, this conglomerate of error makes war against Jesus the Lamb. Third, in earth's last war, Christ and his followers are triumphant. The beast does not win. Jesus does. Have you ever wondered what strategy the devil might use to unite the nations? 
history often repeats itself, we discover valuable lessons from the collapse of the Roman Empire. When the Germanic invasions from the north ravaged Western Europe, the Roman Emperor Constantine turned to religion. The authority of the church, combined with the power of the state, became the very instrument Constantine needed. The continual strengthening of the sanctity of Sunday in the 4th century was a calculated political and religious move to unite the empire at a time of crisis. Constantine wanted his empire united, and the Roman church wanted it converted. The renowned historian Arthur Weigel states it clearly in The Paganism in Our Christianity, published in 1928, page 145. He states, The church made a sacred day of Sunday, largely because it was the weekly festival of the sun, for it was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals endeared to the people by tradition and give them Christian significance. End of quote. At a time of great crisis, when all the world is scared, hurting and fearful, people will be desperate for someone to bring some stability and protection. This is how tyranny has arisen in the past, and there's no reason to think that it could not happen again. According to prophecy, something will bring about these final events. Though it's hard to know how all this could unfold, the world has already seen how great changes can come, and very quickly too. Though we don't know details about what is coming, we need to be ready for whatever does come. Wednesday, June 14, The Mark of the Beast Read Revelation 14.9 and compare it to Revelation 14 verse 12. Where is the mark of the beast placed? And also look at Deuteronomy 6 verse 8 and Deuteronomy 11 verse 18. What two characteristics distinguish God's people from those who receive the mark of the beast? First of all, Revelation 14 verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand... And verse 12, here is the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And Deuteronomy 6 verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And Deuteronomy 11 18, therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. One group worships the beast, and one keeps the commandments of God, which include the fourth, the one commandment, the beast power thought to change, and has the faith of Jesus. That's the contrast. Working through the sea and land beasts, the devil attempts to undermine God's authority by attacking the heart of worship, namely the Sabbath. The mark of the beast is placed either in the forehead or the hand. The forehead is a symbol of the mind where conscience, reason and judgment are located. The hand, in contrast, is a symbol of actions and deeds. The day is coming, and possibly sooner than we think, that laws will be passed restricting our religious liberty. Those who conscientiously follow the word of God and keep the true Sabbath of the Lord will be labelled as opposing unity and the good of society. In the Great Controversy, page 592, we read, Those who honour the Bible's Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness and contempt of authority. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. End of quote. The Church of Rome claims that Sunday is the mark of its ecclesiastical authority. As you read in the American Catholic Quarterly Review of January 1883, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. End of quote. 
Revelation predicts that in the future, at a time of international crisis, our world will face some kind of radical, political, social, religious and moral transformation in which Sunday keeping will be enforced and then will become the mark of the beast. Again, how all this unfolds we have not been told. Scripture gives us only broad outlines, but enough to show us that the great controversy is going to climax around the issue of worshipping either the beast or the creator, and that the seventh-day Sabbath will play a central role. And so to finish the day, in what ways has humanity always been divided along the lines of being on either God's side or on Satan's? Why can there be no middle ground? How can we know for sure just whose side we really are on? Thursday, June 15, The Sabbath Test Even now, perhaps, the stage is being set for this impending persecution. On June 6, 2012, Pope Benedict XVI made an urgent appeal to more than 15,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Square in Rome that Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone, so people can be free to be with their families and with God. He stated, by defending Sunday, one defends human freedom. This isn't, of course, the same thing as demanding that others keep this day as opposed to the biblical Sabbath, but it does show that the idea of Sunday as the day of rest is definitely a real issue. Sooner or later, laws will be passed and those who conscientiously follow the word of God and keep the true Sabbath will be labelled as opposing society's best interests. In this time of crisis, God's faithful people will, by his grace and through his power, stand firm in their convictions to follow him. They will not yield to the pressure. In contrast to the mark of the beast, they will receive the seal of God. Seals were used in the ancient times to attest to the authenticity of official documents. We would then expect to find God's seal embedded in his law. Ancient seals were a distinctive, individualised mark. Isaiah the prophet says, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, in Isaiah 8 verse 16. Read Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11. What elements of a biblical seal do you find in the Sabbath commandment? How is the Sabbath command different from all the other commandments? Exodus 20, beginning at verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. The fourth commandment contains three elements of an authentic seal. First, there is the name of the sealer, the Lord your God, in verse 10. Second, there is the title of the sealer, the Lord who made, in verse 11, or the Creator. And third, There is the territory of the sealer, the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Verse 11. According to Revelation 7 verses 1 and 2, the seal of God is placed only on our foreheads, a symbol of our minds. Let's read that. Revelation 7 beginning at verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, or on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. 
Jesus respects our freedom of choice. He invites us to let him shape our minds by his Holy Spirit so that we cannot be moved from the anchor of our faith in the Word of God, as we read in Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Thus, we understand that the faithful are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, as you've read so many times this month in Revelation 14, verse 12. And included in those commandments is the fourth, the one commandment the beast power thought to change. As we read in Daniel 7:25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. And so to finish the day, what conditions can you see currently developing that could potentially lead to the restriction of our religious liberty? What obstacles remain as well? Friday, June 16. From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 451, we read, When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country, the United States, shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvellous working of Satan, and that the end is near. And Angel Manuel Rodriguez uh, writes in The Closing of the Cosmic Conflict, Role of the Three Angels' Messages, an unpublished manuscript, pages 53 and 54, we have tended to overlook the fact that Sunday is the day of worship of the opposing forces in the storyline of the Book of Revelation. Sunday is the extremely important symbol, revealing the unbelievable craftiness and sophistry of the dragon. This change of God's law expresses in one simple action the very essence of the hatred of the dragon against God in the cosmic conflict. Its simplicity is highly deceptive. The dragon has sought to usurp God's place in the cosmos by depicting himself as the true object of worship and arguing that God's law is unjust, that it should be changed. The dragon changed the law at the juncture within the Decalogue where God is identified as Creator and Redeemer, the only one worthy of worship. And we read about God being the Creator and Redeemer and the only one worthy of worship as we read Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11 again. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 6, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And then he recreates the Sabbath commandment. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And then we read in Revelation 4, 
Verse 11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And Revelation 5, verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And then verses 13 and 14, And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power, be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb for ever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives for ever and ever. The change of the law manifests not only the dragon's hatred for the will of the Lord, the law, but it is also his attempt to usurp God's place by becoming the object of worship. The universalization of this change in the law would assure him victory. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, though living in anticipation, even expectation of final events, why must we be careful about not getting into fanaticism, date setting, or speculating beyond what has been revealed to us through inspiration? What are the dangers of doing this? And what have been the results when the expected events have not unfolded, when and how people have said they would happen? And two, while we must avoid the dangers depicted in the previous discussion question, how do we respond to those who say that our scenario about the mark of the beast and persecution cannot happen because it just doesn't seem possible given the current state of the world? Why is this line of reasoning, though on the surface seemingly sensible, really not sensible at all? After all, look at how quickly great changes can come to the world. And here's Sibylla with Inside Story. Thank you, Sibylla. School Saves by Andrew McChesney a luxury car pulled up at the Seventh-day Adventist Elementary School on the first day of classes in Ukraine. Two children carrying bouquets of flowers emerged from the car, together with their parents. Ukraine children often present teachers with flowers on the first day of school. We want our children to study at your school, the father told the school principal. I'm afraid that's impossible, the principal replied. We don't have room. The father persisted. We will buy new desks and chairs for all the students and pay double the tuition, he said. Please let our children study. The principal wondered whether the father's expectations might be too high. You know, that we don't have government accreditation to hold final exams, she said. Your kids would have to take them at the public school. That's no problem, the mother said. We'll help you get accreditation. You know, this is a Seventh-day Adventist school, the principal said. Adventists are dismissed as a sect by many people in the former Soviet Union. But the father knew it was an Adventist school and he was not deterred. Yes, and we want our children to study here, he said. The mother explained that the family had vacationed at the Black Sea a few weeks earlier and the children had made new friends from the school. Every evening the children had excitedly told their parents about the school and pleaded to go. Then the mother handed her business card to the principal. She was a city judge. Her husband was a high-ranking military officer. The children entered the second and third grade at the school, and they immediately loved it. But as the weeks passed, they began begging their parents to read Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories to them, just as their classmates' parents were reading to them. The mother told the children to ask the teacher to sell the books to them. Then I will read to you every night, she said. The children bought the books and she read to them every night. The months had passed and the children asked to go to Sabbath school and church. The parents took them every Sabbath. The next summer, a year after the family first heard about Adventists while on their Black Sea vacation, both the mother and father were baptised. 
Adventist education is closely connected with the mission of the church, said Ivan Ripolov, education director of the Euro-Asian division, whose territory includes Ukraine. You cannot separate Adventist education and Adventist mission. Wherever schools open, the church grows. Thank you for your mission offerings that support Seventh-day Adventist education worldwide. Greetings, Sabbath school friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath school lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful. 